Hi, everybody. This is Yael here to introduce a bonus episode. This is a conversation that I had with Kara Goodwin, a clinical psychologist and founder of The Parenting Translator. Kara has a phenomenally awesome Instagram account that you can follow at Parenting Translator and a terrific newsletter that also releases as a podcast. All of these are under the title of Parenting Translator. All of her work converges on a central mission of taking scientific research and translating it into information that parents can use in their everyday lives. And so I was truly honored to be on her podcast to talk about working parenthood, which I am currently engaged in since my son is homesick with me today. Yep, I'm homesick. (laughs) <laughs> so we're happy to share this conversation that I had with Kara Goodwin on her podcast and newsletter with our audience about the positives of being a working parent. Sometimes when our guilt says I'm a bad parent, that isn't the truth with the capital T at all. It's quite the opposite, that when you're taking a step away, doing your work, and they're doing their thing, that's actually very good parenting because it's giving them space to be resilient and even attached to other caregivers, which is really good for kids as well as for parents. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Parenting Translator Newsletter. I'm Dr. Kara Goodwin, and I'm so excited today because today I have as a guest Yael Schoenbrunn. And she is the author of a book that I absolutely love called Work, Parent, Thrive. And the purpose of this book is really to help working parents or really any parents that have anything else in their lives besides raising children to understand how to balance these different roles. And so I have a lot of questions for her uh, about all the overwhelming aspects of being a working parent or managing different roles as a parent. Um, So Yael, could you please um, tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So a little bit about me is I'm a parent of three. My three boys are ages 6, 10, and 12. And I'm a clinical psychologist by training. I hail from academia, but I've since moved into some non-academic settings. I write popular books and articles, and I also co-host a podcast on ideas and evidence-based psychology that uh, try to make those ideas accessible for non-academic, non-psychology audiences. And the podcast is called Psychologist Off the Clock. And I also have a small private practice where I specialize in marital therapy and parent coaching. So I wear a lot of professional hats and love parenting and love the science of parenting. So I'm a huge fan of yours as well. That should probably have come first. (laughs) Thank you so much. That's so nice. Um, So why don't we dive right into the questions because I have a lot of questions for you. So we hear so much negativity about being a working parent. Um, I feel like everything you see out there is negative. And one of the things I really love about your book is you emphasize the positives of being a working parent, which is so great because I think we're all too familiar with the negatives. So what does research and your clinical experience tell us about working parenthood that can kind of give us a more positive spin? I just want to first say that that's like the biggest compliment because that was really the driving force behind this book is when I became a working parent and was really struggling and turned to the bookstores and libraries for some, you know, guidance and reassurance. It felt so negative, like everything that I picked up just felt so disheartening. And so this book really came out of a desire of mine uh, as somebody who's really into positive psychology and who is not a natural optimist, but a very dedicated one to offer something to working parents that was realistic, that wasn't sort of pie in the sky, you know, Pollyanna, rainbows and sunshine, but that was really grounded in science and reality, but that didn't feel so depressing and disheartening. So I really think of this book as the parallel to how positive psychology fits into the field of mental health. So just as in the field of mental health, we need to be working to reduce the problems of working parenthood. This guide really focuses on building the positive. And part of building the positive is recognizing that the conflict between roles is real, but it's just one part of a much more interesting story of lives that involve multiple demanding roles. And that even some of the discomforts that we feel inside of the challenges are sometimes not as bad as we might assume and and sometimes have gifts embedded in them that we can take advantage of. So this book is about work-family conflict, but really its sister, which is called work family enrichment. And that's a science-backed construct that is basically defined as the way our roles can help each other out. Now, I talk a lot in the book, and in, uh, we'll probably talk in this conversation a lot about work and parenthood, but this is true about any kinds of competing demanding roles. 
And the idea is that there are different pathways through which our competing roles can actually feed each other, and sometimes in kind of surprising ways. So I'll I'll sort of describe them as three distinct pathways. So the first is the transfer effect. And that's the idea that resources developed in one role can transfer back into another. So if you're home parenting and building patience and compassion in most of our work roles or our friendship roles or our partnership roles, those are skills that are quite beneficial. The skills that we build in one role help another out. The second pathway is something called the buffering effect, and that's the idea that stress in one part of life can be eased by experiences in the other. So if you have a tough day at work, you can go home and have a hug with your kids. If you're going through a different difficult developmental milestone, you can go out to dinner with your partner and have a positive evening. And then finally, there's the additive effect, and that's the idea that the more meaningful roles we have, the better chance we have to have a greater breadth of life experiences and more opportunities to experience a sense of purpose. So more meaning comes from more roles. And and again, all of these ideas, these pathways are really science-backed. There's a lot of evidence for them. But one of the things that we know from research is that if we're not looking for those experiences, we tend to overlook them and not sort of harness the positivity that comes with the experience because what we pay attention to is what we experience And so this book is really trying to call our attention to the ways that positivity can come from the tension between roles so that we can harness more of that goodness. Yes, I love this concept of work, family, enrichment. I feel like it helps put such a positive spin on it and also, you know, helps us to understand how being a parent can help us in our job and vice versa. You know, our job can help us as a parent. My favorite example you give in the book uh, is of the exotic dancer who said that her experience with negotiating with her toddlers helped her to deal with her clients at work. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a hilarious example. And, you know, it helps us to understand that even if, you know, your job is very different than parenting, they can have these positive influences on each other. Absolutely. It's one of my favorite examples too. And I love, I love how she expressed it because she said, you know, now that I'm a mom, when my customers misbehave, I talk to them the way I talk to my toddler. I say, honey, that's not how we behave in here. And it was <laughs> such a great example. And, and as you're saying, you know, there are some roles that more naturally kind of go together. Like as a psychologist, for example, yes. the two of us are, it makes more intuitive sense that our jobs can help our parenting and maybe even that our parenting can help our jobs. But through this book, I interviewed dozens and dozens of working parents from very different kinds of backgrounds, people that were in customer service at utilities companies and people who worked as ship cruise attendants and people who were doctors and physicians and lawyers and engineers and, you know, really the gamut. And in every case, people were able to identify ways that their roles helped each other, sometimes in really surprising ways. And what more is pretty cool is that often people would say, I never thought about it before, but now that you're asking, it's coming up to me. And then later, when I would be in touch with some of these individuals after the interview, they would say, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it's much more obvious and and available to me to sort of see those benefits. And again, that's really the mindset shift that we're going for. Yes. I love that idea of like really intentionally focusing on the positives I'm wondering if you can touch on this idea that I feel like we hear a lot about is um, kind of achieving this perfect balance of work and family or work and life and and this idea of having it all. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of us going into working parenthood had this image that like, I could be it all, you know, I could be a super parent, a super employee and and have to achieve some sort of perfect balance. And what do you think about these myths? And mm-hmm. is there is there a better way to think about it? Yes. Well, I will say first that I bought into that myth hook, line, and sinker, which was one of the reasons that after becoming a working parent, I think I really struggled with a really severe identity crisis because I was like, I worked so hard to get here. I, you know, sweat blood to achieve professional success. I worked so hard to time it all to sort of establish exactly what everybody said. You know, if you do all these things, then you'll be happy. And I was really miserable. And I was like, what went wrong here? And I do think it's this myth that there is a way to just feel happy, which is kind of a general myth that we have in our Western society, that if you do all the things that you'll just feel good. And that isn't what it is to be human. If you're alive and you're human, you're going to feel the full gamut of emotions and feeling sad or disappointed or frustrated or having role tension is not a bad thing. It's just being alive. The more important outcome to seek is to really 
be aware of like how it is that you want to show up moment to moment. What is it that you want to be contributing to the world? How is it that you want to be living your life to be more focused on the process? So the answer to your question is that it is a myth that we can have it all. And it is a myth that we can balance this sort of outcome focused idea of how we're supposed to do life is a mistake. And because life is a journey, life isn't an outcome. So I think about the mistake that we often make and how we think about balance. So when we use the word balance, we often are using it to describe an outcome, but it's far better used as a verb or a process. So think of it like skiing down a mountain. This is a common metaphor. And as you move along the slope, you're always balancing, but you're never done being balanced until the journey is totally complete. So as you're taking the journey, you're shifting from side to side, sometimes more significantly on the steeper slope or icier terrain. And sometimes you fall down and you have to get back up again. And sometimes the train is so hard that you need to call for help or slide down on your butt. And none of that is a problem. It's just the fact of life sometimes having tougher patches and you not having the right resources to get through it. And sometimes it's because you haven't learned enough or built the skill. And sometimes it's because it's just not possible to get through that terrain. It's just too thick with trees or too icy for anybody to get down. And so you're going to have to find a way to give yourself grace that it isn't possible to do this balance thing in the way that you might optimally want to and and sort of be flexible and figure out what what should I do here given what's going on around me and given what resources I do have available. And so I do think moving from an outcome-oriented idea of achievement and balance to a more process-oriented one gives us a lot more wiggle room to work with what we have. I love that idea. I love that how you, you know, related to that, how you talk about the idea of growth mindset and, you know, how can I improve from these difficult situations? I think that's so helpful for parents. I would really love to also dig into the idea of guilt. So this is something I personally struggle with a lot. Um, You know, I have these thoughts sometimes that, you know, I'll never be as productive in my work as somebody who doesn't have children. Or I sometimes feel like I'll never be as good of a mother as somebody who devotes their whole life to their children, um, which is not something I'm currently doing. So I just wonder, how do we handle this guilt? How do we handle feeling like both that we aren't as good as of employees as people who don't have children and this feeling like we aren't as good of parents as people who don't have any other obligations in their lives? It's a great question. And I love this question for somebody who's gaga for research because there's lots of science-backed ways that role tension actually helps us do better as workers and as parents. But here's the thing. It doesn't stop this emotional reflex of feeling guilty. Like the guilt is a part of the human experience too. So what we know about guilt from functional emotion research is that it's an inherently interpersonal emotion whose function is to protect our most important relationships and roles from anticipated harm or from harm that's actually been done. So as a parent, guilt prompts us to make sure that our kids are safe physically and emotionally and that we're ensuring the best possible outcomes for them. And as workers, it prompts us to do right by our employer, colleagues, clients, and even the mission of the company. But emotions, none of them, not not guilt and not any of them, are they are not perfect indicators. So we sometimes feel guilty even when our kids are technically safe. And the reason for that is that our emotions are evolutionarily hardwired into us. So in pre-modern times, guilt was much more likely to protect your children's survival, right? So if you felt guilty because they were out of your sight or they were you know, giving cries of distress, you were much more likely to pull them in and protect them from a predator. But imminent danger is no longer the issue. And so when your kid gives a cry of distress because you gave them the white mac and cheese instead of the orange mac and yeah. cheese, they're not actually in danger. But that higher hard wiring hasn't evolved as quickly as our culture has. And so you're going to have that reflexive response of like, oh, they're they're not happy, right? I didn't show up to their school play. I, I must f- be falling short and protecting their emotional well-being. But what we know from science is that the way that guilt can sometimes prompt us as parents is it pushes us to do this kind of helicopter parenting, which we know is not so good for our kids because it interferes with them learning how to handle the emotions that come along with being human how to handle disappointment, how to creatively problem solve when their parent isn't there to swoop in and, you know, give them the lunch that they forgot or the homework that they left at home. So there are opportunities for us to notice the guilt and not respond to it that are actually quite beneficial. And in fact, sometimes when our guilt says I'm a bad parent, 
that isn't the truth with the capital T at all. It's quite the opposite, that when you're taking a step away, doing your work, and they're doing their thing, that's actually very good parenting because it's giving them space to be resilient and learn independence and creatively problem solve and even attach to other caregivers, which is really good for kids as well as for parents. The same is true with work, and I don't have to go into as much detail, but often guilt prompts us in ways that are inaccurate. But here's the trick. Sometimes it prompts us in ways that are accurate. So for example, if you've been working really hard on a project and you've missed dinner every night for a week and your kids are really missing you and you're really missing them, guilt might be a really important cue to say, okay, like Kara, I need to pause and rethink my work hours and really check in with my kids and have some quality bonding time. So we don't need to, and we shouldn't, throw the guilt out with the bathwater. We can't stop feeling it. But what we can do is learn to relate to it differently. And so the practice, to kind of come back to your initial question of like, what do we do with the guilt, is develop practices of relating to it differently. And the practice goes something like this, which is pause when you feel guilty, get curious, like how much is this guilt informing me in ways that are productive, that line up with the way that I want to be as a parent, with what science says is the most helpful for my work or for my kids, and then choose a behavior that is cued by your guilt, but more directed by your values, how you want to show up moment to moment, given what you know and what's important to you. So it's pause, get curious, and then choose a behavior based on that. And sometimes when you choose, for example, to keep working, you know, in my case, like sometimes I feel really guilty because my kids really love jumping on like the trampoline and I hate jumping on the trampoline. I feel like good moms would enjoy that. They'd like want to get out there and play with their kids. But I have learned to just notice that get curious, like, okay, is this telling me that my kids are missing me or, or or is it just kind of the social comparison that doesn't really help me at all? Okay, you know, my kids are fine by themselves and there's lots of things I do like to do with them that don't involve jumping on a trampoline. I can let them do their thing, get some work done. And then when they're done, then I'll be ready to really mindfully return to really being connected with them. And that actually serves me much better. My guilt doesn't go away. I allow it to kind of be along for the ride but I don't let it drive the choice. That's kind of a silly example, but um, hopefully people can relate it to other more personal ones. Yes, I love that reframe. That's so helpful. Um, It's so funny because I used to feel guilty about, you know, when I would hear mothers who were homeschooling their kids and I'm like, why can't I do that? Like, that would be such an amazing thing, you know, way to bond with my children. And then of course, during COVID, I learned that was not something I was capable of. And so, you know, and sometimes you need like evidence, you know, to refute whatever the guilt is telling you. And and now I have that evidence that like I'm not made to homeschool. And it's actually really bad for our relationship when I was trying to homeschool my kids. You know, I think it's just looking at like what is the actual evidence? Is is there some anything to back up this guilt? I think that's so helpful. Yeah. And like as you're saying that we have we adopt all these social socially driven myths about what good parents do and what good parents should enjoy doing that don't necessarily map onto what works for us. And we are naturally social creatures. So again, we can't stop having those thoughts, but we can learn to pause and reorient like what works for me. I'm the same. I'm a terrible homeschooler and I adore my kids, but I actually see a lot of value in them having teachers who have areas of expertise that aren't mine. So I I don't even think it's necessarily a bad thing, right? There's pros and cons with everything. And so, you know, somebody who loves to homeschool their kids probably is going to have a certain kind of relationship with their kids that I won't have, but my kids will have access to areas of expertise that their kids won't have. You know, we have to sort of pick and choose. There's always opportunity costs and sort of figure out for you what's going to work best is so critical. And by the way, that's what I love about the science that you share, because you're always very clear, like, here's what the science says. And at the end of the day, the science only goes so far. You need to also tailor it to your personal needs, to your family's needs, to your context and circumstances. And that's just as important as what the science says. Yes, exactly. So speaking of that, I would love to dig into how your own values play into this. So, you know, obviously all of us as parents make different decisions, even, you know, those of us who know all the research and a lot of that is based on what are our individual values and what are our goals for our family? And so how do you use values to guide your decisions as a working parent and in a way that you're not just like reacting to guilt or doing what's easiest in the moment? How do you step back and think about these bigger values? Yeah, it's a great question. And maybe 
I'll start by just defining what values are and what they're not just because in the kind of therapy that I practice, which is called acceptance and commitment therapy, they're defined in a particular way as a quality of action. So they describe how it is that you want to show up moment to moment, which is different than a goal. So if you have the goal of getting to the top of the mountain, that kind of gives you like a direction that you want to go in. But values describe how you want to take the journey. And values are also influenced by what's going on around you and what's going on inside of you. So if you're going up the mountain with a friend, how you might want to travel is very different than if you're traveling alone. And if you're feeling really good that day and, and looking to get a workout, how you travel up the mountain might look really different than if you're really tired, but you, you just think it's important for your health to get outside. So values are going to vary depend on depending on what's going on around you, what's going on inside of you. And really distinctly what is important to you in that phase of life. And so as a working parent or somebody who's juggling multiple demanding roles, how you want to show up really is going to change based on the phase that your kids are at or where you're at in your work trajectory, based on how many demands are on you, how much you're sleeping at night, whether you have a partner who's supporting you, whether you're facing racism or misogyny, like it's going to depend on all of that. But what's really helpful, and this kind of gets to the core of your question, is when we clarify what is most important to me in my various roles in terms of how I want to show up, it is helpful to be clear on that because moment to moment, various emotions are going to come up. And emotions are there to drive reflexive action. So when we're in danger and we get angry, we're much more likely to protect ourselves or those we love. And if we're clear on our values, then we can pause before responding to that anger and be more deliberate about allowing values to guide. And so, again, coming back to the question of how is it that you clarify what it is that your values are so that you can act on them moment to moment, there's lots and lots of different exercises that I use in the therapy room. But one of my favorite is just to kind of ask these reflective questions, and they're often perspective-taking questions. So I'll give you a few examples. So One might be consider a difficult patch of life in the past. What is it that you are most proud of having done or having stood for? And based on that, how would you want to handle it the next time? So that's a way to kind of use your past experience to pull out what worked well, what was consistent with how you most want to show up, and to sort of bring it forward. Another one is to kind of use your kids to help you clarify what's important. So what are the main ways that you'd like your children to see or remember you? For a lot of parents, that can be really helpful. Like, I don't want them to see me flying off the handle. I do want them to see me um, experiencing difficulty and kind of really persisting through or having some humor or having a cry and then being able to move on. You know, what are the ways that you want your kids to see you handling a tough moment? And when it comes to juggling multiple roles, you can think about, you know, what are the ways that would make me most proud to have my kids remember me as a working parent? The other one that I really love is to travel forward, say like 30 years, and imagine your older self looking back at your current self in this current patch of life or in this current role. And what are the ways that looking back on yourself in this moment that you showed up that would make you most proud? So these are different ways to kind of pull out what are the qualities of action that are most consistent with how you want to show up moment to moment in a given role or in a given circumstance. That is so helpful. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, So we've talked a lot about changing your mindset about being a working parent, but you also mentioned in the book um, what you call intentional activities to, you know, activities to improve your happiness as a working parent. So can you give us some examples of some intentional activities you can do that might make our lives a little as working parents a little bit better? Yeah, so the idea of intentional activities comes from the research from Sonia Lubomirsky, who's a positive psychology researcher, and she sort of uh, looks at predictors of happiness, and she groups them into three different predictors. So one is life circumstances, so like how much money you have and where you live and your partnership status. The second is your genetics, and both of those count for a good amount of the predictive capacity for how happy you're going to be in general. But the third category is intentional activities. And these actually count for a lot, a lot more than we might anticipate. By the way, life circumstances count for less than we might anticipate because we adapt. It's called hedonic adaptation to to good things. So if you win the lottery, you get used to it much faster than you might think. So what counts as intentional activities in the positive psychology research are things like acts of kindness or gratitude or 
uh, mindfulness or self-compassion or values clarification. So, And in the book, I don't so much talk about gratitudes, but I do talk about uh, more generally like working on our narratives, so the stories that we tell ourselves and the labels that we adopt for how we describe things. And growth mindset is really consistent with those kinds of intentional activities. There's also other kinds of active happiness fostering activities that you can do. For example, making sure that you have daily experiences of agency, so independent choice, competency, experiences of mastery, or experiences of connection, and really focusing on using whatever role is most likely to make those kinds of experiences available to you to have those kinds of daily experiences. Um, Subtracting. So this is not necessarily out of Sonia Lubomirsky's lab, but I think it's an important one for super busy people is understanding that we have a tendency to kind of add to overly full plates. In fact, when we're really busy is when we're less likely to take things off our plate, which is unfortunate because really busy people are exactly the people who need to subtract. So being more deliberate about taking the things that are more trivial out of our daily plans and making sure that we make time to slow down so that we can savor the good things and take care of the things that are hard in ways that are effective. And then I think values clarification really is one of the intentional activities that's most important because it can provide a guide for for happiness and for subtracting and for uh, managing our stress response and all the things that help us to feel like we're living life in the ways that that feel right to us. I love that. I really personally need to work on my subtracting. <laughs> when you said that, I was like, yes, that is exactly what I need to do. Um, so as a parent of three little kids, I have to ask you, does working parenthood change as children get older? It, please, <laughs> I'm begging you, tell me it gets easier. <laughs> That's the answer I want. Yes. Um, but no, honestly, <laughs> does it get easier? How does it change as, as your children get older? So 100%, I think it gets easier. I mean, I'm sure it depends for lots of people, but I have a memory when I had a brand new baby in the doctor's office, some woman with an older child, you know, everybody has these stories, looked at me and said, enjoy these moments. It only gets harder. And I was like, I am so (laughs) sleep deprived and angry right now. (laughs) But so what I will say is the physical toll is so intense when you have little kids because you're not sleeping and they can't walk, they can't change themselves, they need help toileting, feeding. It's exhausting. And most of us, this is just human. We don't do that well when we're completely depleted physically, right? When we're not sleeping and not able to take care of ourselves. And in fact, humans are not wired to rear children alone because it is so demanding. We are wired to rear children in community, and that is just not how our modern world works. We do most of our parenting inside our homes in a very isolated way. And so no wonder it is so hard, so painfully hard when our kids are young. So what I will say is that part gets so much easier. And then, of course, you know, bigger kids have bigger problems and it's more complicated and you worry in different ways. And and that's certainly been true for me. But for me, as somebody who does not operate well on no sleep and no, like I'm somebody who needs both sleep and like a little bit of time to myself to think my thoughts. Parenting young kids was so beautiful and I loved it and I wouldn't have changed it out for the world, but it is much, much easier. Like I just feel better in my skin on a day-to-day basis. That is so helpful to hear. Um, So to end, I would love to hear a personal example you have of a struggle you've had as a working parent and kind of how you've worked through it based on your expertise in this area. You know, I think that one of my biggest challenges when I first started my life as a working parent was delegating childcare to people outside of myself and my spouse. I had this idea that only family should take care of my children. and. It was real, like it was something I struggled with and felt terribly guilty about that I was, you know, handing my infant off to a virtual stranger so that I could go to work. And it was, you know, one of those things that I fought a lot about with my husband because he didn't really get it, why I was so torn up about it. And I just had, you know, yearnings to live near family and we didn't and didn't make professional sense, but I really wanted us to uproot and be near family. So it was this very long-standing challenge for me. And the way that I handled it was to turn to the research, which surprisingly says that it is good for kids to be cared for by people outside of the family, even non-kin. 
both because it gives them an opportunity to connect with other caregivers, which is really good for social um, skill building. So, for example, there's a study that looked at kids who were a little bit socially anxious and those that went to daycare early versus those that didn't actually did better over time with the social anxiety. So you give your kids a chance to be exposed to this discomfort and learn the skills of connecting with other children and caregivers. And also it's good for parents, especially parents like me who need their time alone to think, um, to have a reprieve from parenting. So, you know, it's one of those things where now I'm kind of glad because if I hadn't been a working parent, I probably would have kept my kids with me all the time. And I imagine that that would have been not so great for my mental health and not so great for my kids who probably like, because they're related to me, have some uh, risk for anxiety and, and other mood sort of fluctuations. So I actually think changing my frame, going to the research and sort of finding ways to appreciate what is available within the circumstances that I do have, which is, again, you know, really a part of what the book advocates working parents do was quite helpful. I totally relate to that. I really struggled to um, giving my, you know, especially an infant over to a childcare provider and, you know, feeling guilt and terrible about that kind of separation. But, you know, I totally agree with you on the reading of the research that this is positive for our children. And, and you know, there are some parents that never want to separate for the, from their children and that's what works for them. And they're some parents who need a little bit of space, whether it's working or self-care or whatever it is. So just knowing that that's okay, you know, you're not harming your child in any way. And in some ways you could be giving them some experiences they wouldn't have otherwise. A hundred percent. And I will say too, that even if you are a parent who loves to be around your kids all the time, like that's so awesome. And I still think that all parents need breaks and, and that we should encourage one another to not feel guilty about it. So even if you don't have to go to work, quote unquote, you know, ask for help and get a break once in a while because it's good for everybody. And, you know, relish the time with your kids if you enjoy it. That's so wonderful. But it is so normal and healthy and human to need a break from kids. They they need a lot from us. And, and there's something so wonderful about that to be needed like that and so beautiful and connecting and, you know, life affirming. But the heart can only beat 24 hours a day because it gets rest between beats. So we need to parent like that, too. I love that metaphor. Well, thank you so much. This has been so incredibly helpful for me personally, and I know it will be for my audience. So I cannot thank you enough. Um, can you tell us one more time where to find you? Sure. Um, so you can find me on my podcast, which is Psychologists Off the Clock, and you can get that wherever, wherever you get your podcast. And then um, you can also find me at my writer's website, which is workparentthrive.com. And then I'm on social media uh, you can just find me by looking up Yael Schoenbrunn. Well, thank you so much, Yael. I really appreciate you and your time and your expertise. And I know everybody else will as well. Thank you so much for having me. It was such an honor to speak with you. 